Hello and welcome to ADC 2020. Uh, this is Drop the Daw, Sound Design in Python, and I'm Isaac Roberts. Uh, so first of all, Python is as in Monty Python, uh, not the snake. Uh, so Python is like a fun, easy language to use. It's written to be like pseudocode. Uh, it's sort of designed for prototyping, and it has a bunch of features to make it easy for you to write in, which gives it a very fast, flexible development time. Um, so the reason it's perfect for sound design specifically is first of all, you can avoid some of that DAW overhead. Uh, you can just write code to make sound and you don't have to worry about as much of the, the DAW overhead. Uh, you get access to scientific libraries like NumPy, SciPy, and Numba. Uh, these will sort of help back up your like array handling and your math and stuff that you need to do for sound design. Uh, the math is also more accessible because of these languages. Uh, it makes it very easy to use. Uh, those functions are just there. Uh, it gives you sort of an iterative development environment. So uh, we have two methods for that. We have Jupyter and we have live compiling, which I'll show you later. Um, and then you get access to machine learning and simulation and sort of more advanced topics through Python. So the details of Python. Python is an interpreted language, which means it's being compiled as you run it. Uh, it's got a dictionary backend, which is like a key value pair on a binary search tree. And this dictionary gives Python some of that flexibility. It allows dynamic typing. Um, it allows like changing variables on the fly. It allows, you could even override a function on the fly. Uh, a whole bunch of stuff to make it very easy to use and flexible. Uh, it's got built-in data structures, it's dynamically typed, all that contributes to making it a flexible language. Um, so NumPy is the corollary to Python. It's sort of so important that we had to put it in this first slide here. Uh, it's an array handling library with a lot of math in it. Um, it is vectorized, which means instead of writing for loops to iterate through your arrays, you could do your operations on the entire array. So array one equals array two plus array three. Uh, and it's got a C++ backend, which makes it very fast. Uh, NumPy is also the basis for like all machine learning and like modern scientific computing in Python today. Um, so the advantages of Python, first of all, the development time, fast, flexible, easy to write in. Uh, you get access to these scientific libraries, uh, which back up the math and the science that you're going to need to do to do sound design. Uh, you get overlap with machine learning and research fields, and you also get access to Magenta, uh, which is Google's sound design library. The disadvantages of Python, first of all, a slower runtime. Um, Python gets a pretty bad rap for being slow. Uh, we're going to talk about some tools that make it faster, but it is still going to be slower than C++. Uh, you don't get access to the DAW, so you won't be able to port Python code into a VST. Uh, if you design something cool in Python, you're going to just want to uh, either bounce those to samples or rewrite it in C++. Uh, and you also don't get access to uh, existing libraries like Juice, uh, so you're going to have to find modules in Python that do that stuff for you. Um, so flying without the DAW can have its advantages. The first one is you can avoid that real-time guarantee. Uh, you can build longer computations. So you, instead of having to spend one second of computing time generating one second of audio, uh, you can now spend 10 seconds of computing time to generate that second of audio, uh, which gives you a lot more flexibility and a lot more power in terms of rendering your sounds. Uh, you also get an iterative design process through the two methods that we'll talk about, Jupyter and live compiling. Uh, and you can also just sort of play it fast and loose with writing code. Uh, you don't have to worry as much about uh, typing, memory management, um, stuff like that. You can also avoid some of those DAW-specific things, like uh, the multi-threading isn't as stringent in Python. Uh, you don't have to worry about changing the block size or the sample rate. You don't have to worry about parameters, stuff like that. Uh, you also get some advantages to avoiding real-time. Um, so if you're working in a rendering context, you can look ahead in the MIDI to see what's coming, um, and you can render the sound uh, more accurately and more expressively based on that. So the first and easiest thing to do is generate envelopes based on length. So you look ahead in the MIDI, see that this node is one second long, and then you just generate a linear envelope that decreases over the course of that second. Uh, and that's a very small change you can do in a rendering context that makes your sounds uh, just instantly more expressive and there's more variation in the notes, uh, it's, it sounds a lot better. Uh, you can also add lead time to notes. So if you've got something simple like a theremin where you might want the player to start uh, moving their hand before the note starts to give it a smoother note start, um, you can do that in a non-real-time context. Uh, you can also build in some of the complexities of something like a, a guitar where the user would like take their finger off of one string, put their finger on the, on the next fret, and then pluck the string. 
uh, you can incorporate those complexities into the instrument, uh, stuff like that. Um, so NumPy is a math library for Python. Import NumPy as NP. It's math and array manipulation, so it's got like indexing and slicing and uh, select along axis, sum along axis, all those kinds of things that you would need to, to manipulate an array. Uh, it's also vectorized, which means instead of looping through the arrays to do those operations, uh, you can do the operations on the entire array. So you can say array.sum along axis one, or you could say array one equals array two plus array three. Uh, a lot of stuff in the sort of vectorized paradigm. Uh, and it's also got a C++ backend, which makes it very fast. Uh, so the great thing about NumPy is that your 10 lines of C++ code will translate to one line in NumPy. Um, uh, so here we've got a dot product. It's a uh, operation from geometry. It gives you the cosine of two vectors. Um, but you can see here, we take in the two arrays. We have to declare a new array in memory. We have to clear that array. Uh, we have to loop through both dimensions and then calculate the result. Where in NumPy, we can just say array one times array two sum along the first axis. Uh, and that's really all we need. And the, the great thing about this is not only are you spending less time writing code and less time typing, but you're also sort of like writing less bugs. So when you write this C++ code, it would be very easy to accidentally put a bug in here somewhere uh, because it's so much code, it's not instantly readable. Um, you could like flip these two elements or something like that, put a uh, greater than sign here. Um, in NumPy, the code is this one line. Uh, you can still make typos, but it's a lot easier to read the code and instantly see, yeah, that's right, I want array one times array two sum along the first axis. So yeah, not only the development time, but also the development process and you know, writing, fixing bugs, writing code, all that is a lot easier in NumPy. Um, so here's some one-liners in NumPy. Uh, we've got all of our basic oscillators uh, and I'm gonna show them to you in a Jupyter notebook. Um, so all we, working in the NumPy paradigm, we generate an array of our time step. And so that's just the time in seconds at each point in the array. Uh, we take the frequency, multiply by the frequency by two pi. Um, we take the sine of that whole array and it gives us a sine wave. Um, saw is similarly easy. We just use a modulus. Uh, square, we use a where statement, which is like an if. Triangle is the same as the saw, but with an absolute value in there. Um, we also have a compressor. Um, compressor's a little bit longer. Uh, these were kind of the only two that would fit in literally one line. Uh, but a compressor is just a nested where statement. This is where the sound is greater than the threshold, limit it downwards. Where the sound is less than the negative threshold, limit it upwards, else pass the sound. Um, distortion's pretty easy. There are lots of different types of distortion, but it's essentially doing some math operation on the whole array. Uh, and, and that's perfect for NumPy. Here we clip it from negative one to one, which is the acceptable values of an arc sign. And then we run it through an arc sign, which gives it a very grungy feel. Um, so some extensions to NumPy. Uh, there are a lot of libraries that have been built on NumPy and use NumPy both on the front end and the back end. Um, one spe that's specifically useful for sound design is SciPy. Uh, so SciPy has filter design and analysis. Uh, the different types of filters, as well as like frequency response graphs, poles and zeros analysis, uh, the processing. Uh, SciPy has convolutions, which are necessary for reverb. Uh, SciPy has inter interpolation, which is something you can use to design an envelope by just placing points on a curve, uh, placing points in, in a space, and then having NumPy or having SciPy uh, draw the curve between those points. Uh, it's also got pooling, which is useful for envelope detection. You take the uh, take the period of the wave, run a max pool at that period, run a mean pool to smooth it out, perfect envelope. Uh, Numba is one of those tools to make Python faster. It is a just-in-time compiler, so the first time you run a Numba function, it will compile it into machine code, and then every subsequent time you run that function, it'll be a lot faster. Uh, so all it is is a decorator, it's one line that you add to the top of the function, uh, and it's great for speeding up non-vectorized code. Um, yeah, so here's some Python code that is non-vectorized. Uh, non-vectorized just means it has a for loop in it, essentially. Um, a filter is a great example of something that can't be vectorized because each sample is dependent on the previous sample. Um, so here we've got a filter object, set up the filter, run through it in this filter function, uh, loop through the array. We run 10 seconds of audio, 10 times on it, and it takes 5.8 seconds to run, um, which is not bad, but if you're running uh, like a lot of filters, like if you've got 20 filters on your object, uh, this will damage your real-time guarantee and really slow down your code. 
Uh, all we have to do to transform it into number is move this filter function into a static function, uh, pass in all the member variables, return any member variables that have changed, uh, and then add this number decorator at number.inget. Uh, that sends it to the number compiler, compiles it into machine code, and runs it. Um, and then every, every time after that, it's a lot faster. We run 10 seconds of audio 10 times, and this time it takes 0.28 seconds. Um, so that's a 20 times speed up, and all we had to do was move this into a static function at a decorator. Amazing. Um, so Numba is great for repeated function calls because it compiles it that first time you call it. Uh, it's great for any place with a for loop since that is pure Python. Um, the explanation for that is that essentially NumPy has that C++ backend, so compiling that into machine code won't have as much speed up. Um, so if you're sort of using NumPy but not using it correctly, not using it in that vectorized sense, you got for loops and stuff like that, uh, then Numba is perfect and it'll speed up that function a lot. Uh, if you're already using NumPy, it won't speed it up as much. Uh, it's non-object oriented. Uh, it doesn't really work well with Python objects because it needs to know the types of everything. Um, so sometimes you'll have to take variables out of an object to use it with Numba. Uh, and it's also not compatible with everything in general. It's not compatible with a lot of SciPy functions and it's not compatible with certain features of NumPy, like uh, you can't use keyword arguments in any of the functions. Um, yeah. um, so Jupyter is a development environment for Python. Uh, the great thing about Jupyter is that instead of running the, the whole program, one program at a time, uh, you run cells individually. Uh, and a cell is, is a, a line or multiple lines or a function or something like that. Uh, and because you're running these lines individually, uh, you can keep the output. So you get the output from this cell and then you can like copy it, keep using it, keep modifying it and stuff like that uh, to continue iterating on your design. Uh, Jupyter also has everything you need to do sound design. It's got graphs, it's got audio output, audio input, print statements, stuff like that. Um, so here's an example on the right. We've got some long running function. We wait for that to finish. It takes a while. Uh, we come back, we listen to the output, see what it sounds like. Uh, we notice it doesn't quite sound right. There's something going on in the high ranges. Uh, so we run it under a low pass to see if we can clip that out. Uh, and we can keep iterating on this because the sound object, the sound array is saved, is, is present. Um, we can low pass it, see if that fixes it. Uh, if that doesn't quite fix it, we can graph it, uh, look at the waveform, see what's wrong with it, and then go back to this top function and try to fix it. So using Jupyter for sound design, we have input and output with ipywebrtc and ipython.display.audio. Uh, one tip for using that audio command is set autoplay to true. Uh, that gives you just a little bit of a faster uh, iterative development time by saving the couple seconds it takes to click the play button. Uh, but it also helps if you've got some kind of long running function and you wanna run it, go do something else, uh, and then hear some kind of notification when it's done. Uh, that autoplay on your output uh, will, will give you that notification. Uh, the second thing is store your parameters in a dictionary. So if you've got functions that you're building and they have parameters to them, uh, you want to be able to, to tune those parameters without having to scroll up and down in your, in your Jupyter notebook. Uh, but it also lets you build like different settings for the functions, like different presets almost. Um, so if you've got different songs and you want to run them under different presets. Um, and the third thing is write a utility file. So I've got a jupyter-tools.py and at the top of every notebook, I write import Jupyter tools as JT. It's got my type safe array functions. Um, so stuff like add two arrays and make sure neither one is null, uh, add arrays of different lengths and handle the different lengths, stuff like that. Uh, it's got my envelopes and oscillators, uh, like the sine, saw, square, triangle, stuff like that. Uh, so I don't have to remember the function for those. Uh, it's got MIDI lookup so I can convert MIDI note number 60 or MIDI name C4 uh, to frequency, stuff like that. Uh, just a bunch of stuff to sort of make my life easier while I'm programming. Um, so now we're going to get into some math uh, that we'll need for sound design, and I'll also show it to you with some demos in a Jupyter Notebook using NumPy. Um, the first one is frequency over time. Uh, so we've got anything with a changing frequency that could be a pitch bin, that could be like a kick drum, where the note starts at one frequency and quickly changes to another. Uh, all that is, you've got an array of frequencies uh, at each time step. Uh, you want to combine them into a wave without getting phase effects. Uh, all you have to do is cumulative sum. In NumPy, that's just one function, the cum sum. Uh, run it through the frequencies, multiply by two pi. Uh, here is our example for that one. We're going to be doing a kick drum. 
Um, so you can see here we've got our cumulative sum to get the phase, run the wave over the phase. Um, for our kick drum, we're starting at 1000 hertz for the hit and dropping to 87 hertz for the bass note. Uh, we generate our frequencies on like a t to the fourth power curve, um, get this array. Uh, we run it through the summation and we listen to it. There we go. The next one is exponential decay. So exponential decay is a function that loses a percentage of its energy each step. Uh, it's kind of like a half-life, if you've ever heard of that term. Uh, it's good for percussive envelopes. Uh, it's any instrument that has a membrane. You strike the membrane, and then it vibrates until it runs out of energy. So kind of like this. And you can hear that. It, it started out loud, it dropped off quickly, and then it hung around for a long time, sort of approaching zero. Uh, so all you have to do for that is numpy to exponent of negative x, or 0.5 to the power of x, with those uh, two asterisks instead of a caret. Um, so since we're using that as an envelope, um, we are generating random noise, uh, white noise, to use as the bass sound. Uh, so that's just random numbers from negative one to one. Here is that. We generate our envelope, which is 0.5 to the power of 25 times t. There we go, hi-hat. Moving on, we have the logistic curve. Logistic curve is also known as the sigmoid function, also known as carrying capacity. Uh, it's a function that grows exponentially, but then reaches and approaches a maximum value. Uh, it's great for smooth transitions because it's, it's smooth. Um, it's almost, when you listen to it, it's almost hard to tell where the note starts. Um, it's great for pitch bend, it's great for volume change, uh, it would go great on a theremin. Uh, and all that is, is the direction you're moving divided by one plus the exponent of negative speed, which is the slope of that middle curve right there, uh, times x minus the center point. Um, so for the base sound for this one, we're going to do another cool math function, which is the sine of the tangent of x. Uh, that gives you a cool, like, alien sounding noise. Uh, we're going to multiply it by our logistic envelope to fade it in. There we go. See how smooth that is? Uh, and then we're going to do another logistic envelope to fade it out, uh, but make this one a little sharper. Let's see what the 15 is the speed there. There we go. And since we got all our sounds, let's put them together and see what they sound like. There we go. Um, so some more math that we won't do demos for. Uh, the first one, the sine of the tangent of the x is how we got that alien sound effect. Uh, random numbers from negative one to one on a standard distribution is how we got that white noise. Uh, np.random.sample. Um, saturation is a cool thing that uh, adds like presence to a sound. Uh, if you, it only works on a sine or a saw be, due to the math, uh, but it's stacking powers of the wave. So you take the sine of x plus the sine squared of x plus the sine cubed of x plus the sine of the fourth, um, as high as your computer is willing to go. Um, and that's one of the advantages of rendering. Uh, and it, yeah, it, it fills out a sound uh, almost in a reverb-like way. Uh, we've also got intervals, which are based on string physics. Um, so all you do for that is the wave at frequency f, the wave at double the frequency, the wave at triple, quadruple, Again, as high as your computer will go. Um, and that's based on like nodes in physics, and it's great for a stringed instrument. Um, note intervals are a simpler version of that. Uh, note intervals are almost a hack to make your sound sound better. Uh, it's essentially a chord. You take the note, and then you add the same note seven steps up, or five steps up, and it'll make any sound just like more interesting and make a sound pop. Um, so bugs can be good and interesting in sound design. They can give you something unique and original. Uh, that you weren't really intending to make. Uh, they work really well for one-off sounds, like you want to put something before the drop, uh, try out a bug that you've created. Um, I looked up examples of famous bugs in music history, and one of them was the Moog, uh, the, specifically the Moog's overdriven filter. Um, so the engineer that was designing it uh, accidentally overvolted that filter by 16 decibels right before they put it into production. Uh, and by the time they noticed it had already gone into production, and the musicians were already getting their hands on it. Uh, but when the musicians got it, they found that it 
that overdriven filter made it really cut through the track and so they could layer their sounds with a bunch of different sounds and then add that Moog and it would again cut through the track and, and really be present and something the listener could instantly hear. Um, here's an example of a reverb glitch I had. I was trying to home roll some convolutions for reverb by doing my own FFT and I messed up the math on the FFT so it was playing in both directions at the same time and also repeating uh, due to some, some ring buffer glitches. So here it is. There we go. Um, next, we're moving on to Python real-time applications. Uh, that's how I recorded that previous sound. It was just a speaker to microphone. So when you're transitioning to Python applications from C++, you know, VSTs, um, you're going to have to think about a few things differently. So the first is the real-time guarantee gets just a little bit harder. Uh, you would think that it would be a lot more speed loss than it is, but it's actually maybe like 80% of that ceiling uh, you can do 80% as many computations as you could in C++. One thing that you can do to, to meet that real-time guarantee when you're working with Python is render your sounds to samples when the program starts running, uh, and then just play from your sample bank uh, as, the, as the audio plays. Um, Python can handle sampling pretty well, uh, better than it can handle like generating the arrays. You'll also need to do block safety checks uh, since we don't have like static typing. Um, an array that we create and modify could be any data type. Uh, it might be the wrong channel amount. Uh, it might be the wrong like C slash Fortran order, which is a NumPy quirk. Um, uh, it could also be like null in the worst case. Um, so you need in your in your audio callback, you sort of need functions that go through each of those, uh, check the data type, check the order, check the channel amount um, so to make sure that it won't crash your audio thread. Uh, and, and handle it before you return it. Uh, you also don't need to worry about multi-threading as much. Um, the way that Python does its garbage collection, you can sort of delete an object just by like removing it, like just lose the object. And you know, if you have some other thread that's currently using the object, it can keep using it, and only when it's finished using that object will it be deleted. Um, so yeah, multi-threading is a lot easier. I rarely have problems with it. Um, you can also use try blocks in Python where they don't really catch everything in C++. Um, so you can, you can c catch errors in your audio thread and continue processing. You could even have a try block on each module and just like bypass the module if it crashes. Uh, with a try block, it'll, it'll catch any error in Python essentially. Um, so the libraries that we'll, we will need to build Python applications uh, the first one I use is PyQt for the graphics. Uh, that lets me sort of build this application just on a grid format. So I can say button in row one, four buttons in row two, a uh, knob in both rows, and it'll just like align that for me and I don't have to worry so much about ordering the pixels of the window. Um, I use uh, PyAudio for streaming input and output. Uh, it works the same as a C++ audio callback. Uh, it passes you data and then expects you to return data. Uh, along with like a pause, continue, or stop command. Um, I use RT MIDI for MIDI input and MIDI files. Um, it has uh, polling and events and everything you need to do that. Uh, I use sound file for reading and writing WAV files. Uh, it also lets you stream data into a WAV file so you can write uh, 512 samples or whatever the chunk size is. Uh, you can write each chunk of audio to a WAV file uh, in each callback. Uh, and then I use import lib for live compiling, which is in the next slide. So live compiling, I've put this graphic here because we got a DJ in the booth. Uh, he is writing code to uh, change his sound on the fly and he's getting a syntax error on line one. Um, so that sums it up. Let me sh just show you what it is.
And if you can't tell, that was uh, Heartache by Toby Fox from Undertale. Um, so live compiling is the ability to write code, reload code from the GUI, uh, and then instantly hear the results. Uh, it's great for the flow of your sound design. Uh, you can write code, and since you're hearing the results so quickly, you can, you can like, know and be aware of what each thing does to the sound. Uh, it gives you a lot more freedom to like, experiment while you're designing it, uh, since it's such a fast iterative development time. Uh, it's also great for A-B testing. Uh, you can write something, change something, and since it you know, changed so quickly, you can remember, like, did that make it better or worse? Is it the right direction, wrong direction? Stuff like that. It's great for designing, and it gives you a very iterative process which is what we promised before. Um, so the two steps you need for live compiling, the first step is you need to wrap your objects that you want to compile. We're going to use a decorator, uh, which is a, a Python-specific Python thing. Uh, a decorator is a function that accepts a class as an argument and returns a modified class, or maybe a different class. Uh, so here we've got what we're using is an instrument decorator. It's a function that accepts a class, and then we create a wrapper object, um, you know, initialize the object and all that, and then we return this wrapper object. Um, and then to use it, we just add this at instrument decorator to the top of the piano class. And every time we use piano, it'll be sent to this decorator and wrapped in this object. Uh, step two is we will need to write the reload function, um, which is a bit of deep Python magic. Um, I would suggest you sort of just like pause the video here and like copy it down and it'll work out of the box or find it on YouTube and copy it down from there. Uh, I might put it up in Discord or something like that. Um, so th some things to remember before we get into the code. The first is that Python uses a dictionary backend, um, which means all the member variables, all the functions, all the class attributes are stored on a dictionary, which you can look up and access. Uh, the second thing is that decorators are zealous. So when you add that decorator to an object, it'll, it'll replace it with that wrapper in places where you wouldn't expect it to. Um, so we'll have to get around that a little bit, and I'll show you how to do that. Uh, and the third thing is that Python uses two functions on the back end to handle its variable access and its function call, uh, and it lets you override both of them. Um, the first one is to look up objects and member functions that are on the object, uh, and the second one is if they aren't, it gets sent to this getitur uh, function. Um, so we can override that to handle our wrap object. Um, so here is the decorator code. We've got our instrument decorator, with, which is a function. Um, we need to create the object that is wrapping the instruments in this function, um, which is something Python will let you do. Uh, we create this object, we store the class that we're wrapping, uh, we instantiate an instance of the class that we're wrapping, uh, and then we store the arguments and keyword arguments uh, that were initially called on this so that we can use them later. Uh, we're going to use this getAtcher function to forward any member variable access or function calls that are called on this wrapper. Uh, so if we call a play note on this wrapper, it will forward it to the instrument uh, and then return that return value and handle that for us uh, so we don't have to think about this wrapper so much. Um, we also use this instrument wrapper type, which is a meta class. So if you call type of instrument wrapper, you would get instrument wrapper type, you would get this object. Um, all we're doing with this one is we're storing the class as O, um, and that's for readability later on. Uh, and then we were using get attribute to forward uh, static function calls. So if we wanted like piano.get standard length, um, it would go to this thing and then go through this get attribute forwarding. Um, the reload step is again some deep Python magic. You can just copy this down and uh, no one will get mad at you. Um, so first we get the name of the module from the class. Um, it's an attribute that is stored in Python that we can access. We look up that module in the system.modules table uh, to get the module object. We use import lib to reload it. Um, this sort of setup allows us to reload arbitrary modules, whereas you would normally type the name of the module there. Um, we then get the name of the class out of that newly reloaded module. Uh, you notice we have to use a dot O here because the decorator is zealous and we're accessing this object right here, this member variable. Um, we then instantiate the new class with the arguments that we stored from before. Uh, we, we do not replace the new object until it is successful. 
And this is to help with multi-threading. Uh, essentially, while this constructor is running, uh, the, the audio thread might call this wrap object uh, for getting audio frames. Uh, and we want it to not call this new object until the new object is successfully created. Um, we have this try catch block because this reload function can fail if there's a syntax error in the code. Uh, this import lib.reload step will fail and get caught by the catch block so that our application doesn't crash. Uh, and then we will use traceback to print the full exception uh, so that we can see what the error is and what line it's on and stuff like that. Um, so using it, um, we add this instrument decorator to the object we want to reload and everything that inherits from it. Um, because this decorator is so zealous, we have to add the dot O when we inherit it from, some th from something. Uh, because it will instantly try to inherit from the instrument wrapper. Um, we can use the object normally. We can call instrument.playNote, and it will use that get attribute forwarding to pass it to the instrument and get it back. Uh, we can call reload as a function. We can call it from anywhere, uh, and we don't have to do anything other than this. All the other code is stored in this reload function. Um, the only thing that's a little more difficult now is that the type function and the isInstance function doesn't work, uh, because the type of this instrument wrapper is this instrument wrapper type class, which is of course stored in a function that we can't always access. Um, so we have to do if the type of the instrument.name is instrument wrapper, then check the type of the thing it's wrapping. Uh, so now we're going to get into some advanced topics. Uh, these are sort of what you get access to when you stick with Python for sound design. Um, the first thing is rendering. Um, since you can run in a non real time context, you can run in a rendering context. Uh, you can put like more unisons, more intervals, more saturation into the sound. Uh, essentially, you can run 10 seconds of computing time to generate one second of audio. Um, you can also do things like put more reverb on an instrument. Uh, Real-time contexts always have a problem with reverb because it's a pretty slow operation. Um, you can spend more computational time to decide the note controls and stuff like that. Um, since you're since you're rendering directly to a particular sound, you can, you can more finely control your song uh, because you can write code that is specific to this one song. And if the song needs like some vibrato in this part, you just say add vibrato from this part to that part, and you don't have to like get a plugin that does that or something like that. Uh, you can also put lead time on an instrument, uh, which we talked about earlier. Uh, so simulation is something really cool. It's a field that's chugging along um, in, in the Python world. Um, you can do like fluid flow simulations for you know perfectly precise like reverb uh, you could do instrument body simulations for more realistic physically grounded instruments um, the takeaway is that you could build instruments that are realistic and and have physical basis and so they would sound real to the listener uh, but you could also change things about that simulation um, to create like otherworldly and impossible instruments and create something really cool uh, so machine learning is certainly a thing you can do in sound. Uh, Python is the machine learning standard. Um, in terms of machine learning, you're going to, if you're doing machine learning in sound, you're going to work, want to work in the frequency domain. Uh, you don't want to generate samples like this. You want to work with FFTs. Uh, we also have access to three really cool advanced forms of machine learning. So the first one is autoencoders. Uh, autoencoders take input data, uh, lots of input data, and compress them into a smaller space, but they compress along patterns in the data. So if you were compressing like landscape images, you might notice that the the sky is always blue in these images. So instead of saving a blue pixel at each point in the sky, you just save how blue the sky is and then save which points are the sky and you know save a lot of data like that. So you're you're sort of looking for patterns in the data to compress along. Um, they can give you, autoencoders can give you something really like unpredictable, but not too unpredictable uh, because they're following patterns in the data. Uh, it would just be mildly unpredictable, which is perfect for sound design. Um, something really cool that they could be used for is if you've got a huge multi-sampler library, just like hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes, you could use autoencoders to compress that into a latent space uh, with like patterns in the data. And then on the user's machine, when they run their VST, they would have this model generating that sound from that model, uh, from that compressed space. Uh, style transfer is another really cool thing in sound design. Uh, what it does is it takes levels of detail in an image or a sound and can sort of mix and match them. 
Um, so here in this example, we've got a cat and the broad strokes is the, the shape of the cat and like the object and stuff like that. Uh, and the brush strokes are Van Gogh's Starry Night uh, or Edward Munch or Mosaic. Uh, and we can generate that broad strokes image with the brush strokes of something else. So we can create that cat in Van Gogh's Starry Night. Uh, it would be great in sound for like fusing two instruments together. So you could take the broad strokes of a guitar with the brush strokes of a violin. Um, you could also build like a style transfer effects, um, like train a model on Eddie Van Halen's guitar and, uh, and you know, create an effects plugin that takes any input sound and converts it into Eddie Van Halen's guitar, something like that. Uh, generative adversarial networks are the other cool one. Uh, generative adversarial networks are sort of the best for machine creativity. If you've ever seen like the deep dream models, those are generative adversarial networks, GANs. Um, they use an imposter art critic paradigm. So one AI is the imposter and they're trying to create uh, art that passes as real. And the second one is the art critic who's trying to tell which art is real and which art is synthesized. Uh, they were actually used in Google's InSynth. That's it. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Uh, if you're interested in some of the things that come out of this Python code and some future development, check out algorithmicsounds.com. Uh, I'll be putting up some sounds there. This sound that's currently playing is up there. Um, if you're interested in a free multi-sampler that will be coming soon, uh, put your name down in the newsletter on algorithmicsounds.com. Uh, if you're interested in commercial plugin design, uh, you can either talk to me after the presentation or check out isaacroberts.tech and email me or call me from there. That's it. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I will now be taking questions. I see one from Regis. Curious how this compares with an environment language like Super Collider that is built for sound design? Um, so I haven't used one of those. It definitely doesn't have the... Uh... Uh, it doesn't have some of the, the sound design stuff built into the code, and it's not built around it as much. Um, but it is very quick like that. Um, there's also sort of more freedom since it's, you know, a standard, like, Turing complete language. Thanks. Okay, great. Does anyone else have any questions? If you could type hmm. those into the Q&A part. Here we go. Uh, yes, let me send... Uh, give me a minute, uh, but I'll send the Jupyter notebook and the uh, um, and the the instrument decorator on the Discord. And then we have the question here from Cody. Do you see that, Isaac? Are there audio examples of the style transfer GAN you mentioned there at the end? Um, so those. Uh, four or five topics are like future development. Um, style transfer I worked on a little bit, but didn't get any results yet. Uh, sort of had to work on other stuff. Um, I think there's a neural DSP that's using style transfer. And then, uh, yeah, there are, there are some examples if you search like research papers. Uh, and then, yeah, a couple of plugins for, for style transfer. Great. And do you see that next one? Uh, send the notebook and slides. The, yeah, I can. Yeah, which IDE do you recommend for audio processing with, with Python? Um, I use Atom, uh, nothing too complex. Uh, Atom doesn't try to like compile for you. Uh, so you can use the terminal and then uh, that prevents it from like getting in the way of the, the live reload situation. Personal preference, but I prefer Adam. Excellent, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Here we go. We've got two more popping in. Um, I think it was from messing around with FFTs and trying to turn stuff into MIDI and then back into music, um, which is another project that didn't really work. Uh, but like, yeah, experimentation with stuff like this, um, doing some like physics simulations and stuff like that. Thanks. Yeah. 
And let's see, do you see Dara's question? Does Numba work with C Python? I have no idea. I would doubt it. Um, you can generally Numba has to know what everything is in its function or in its object that it's compiling. Um, so yeah, it, it can't handle much. Uh, it can't handle like keyword arguments. Uh, so I would doubt it. But it's it's something that I believe Cyclone would be at a similar speed to Numba uh, because the C++ speed. All right, and let's see. Oh, I see it. I see. All right, I see Robert's question. What is the learning curve for a student just getting into programming and audio? Maybe they know a little Python and a little audio. Um, so it is really fast to get some basic stuff going. Um, yeah, I'd say it's a decent learning curve. Like that live demo that we saw of typing sign, saw, and square, um, those functions will be in the Jupyter Notebook. They're also like in the slides where you can copy them down. Um, so you really can just type like sine of x times 5, and that's, um, you know, a sine wave at frequency times 5. Um, stuff like that yeah so it's it's really easy to like get on that and then it's not that bad to continue working with it and then marcus asked the jupiter notebooks are on your website um i'll, I'll put them up there afterwards i'll put them on isaacroberts.tech i think um and then i will send them in the discord Great, and then let's see, we'll go ahead and take one or two more. Chris says, how did you get into learning about generating all of the wave functions and stuff? Where did you begin when learning how to generate these sounds and effects? Um, uh, I mentioned that one. So that one was messing around with FFTs and converting uh, sound into MIDI and then back into sound, which was a cool experiment, didn't work. Um, uh yeah and sort of experimenting with sound in a language that i already knew um about sequencing and melody comp composition um so you can generate midi without having to use midi files um there are there are midi languages but you could um you could just treat the treat the MIDI notes as numbers and then just start generating integers in an array, in a NumPy array, um, uh, instead of doing a standard thing, you could just have uh, like a, just a list of Booleans with NumPy on off kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, NumPy really allows you to do algorithm design, which is the name of the website. Um, but yeah, that's what it's great for. Thanks. Um, could you point out any specific considerations for Python multi-threading in a real-time context? Um, so yeah, if you're doing a real-time context, you can't take advantage of that 10 times computing time. Uh, that comes from, uh, like being able to render it outside of a DAW, essentially. Um, you can take it into a rendering context, uh, especially if trying to the the thing you could do to get this is you know have your program when your program starts you you render the sound into samples uh, and then you play them back from the audio thread um can you point out any specific did i answer it ask another one if i didn't answer i believe you did yeah. excellent well thank you so much isaac that was fantastic yeah. And I hope everyone got some great information out of that. Please be sure to go back to Remo, check out the Expo Hall if you haven't already. And tomorrow we have some amazing speakers and presentations as well. But um, if you want to just go ahead and just uh, say your website one more time, in case people mm -hmm. want to look up more of that information. Um, for the sounds and plugins that are coming soon, we have the sound that was playing. We have a multi-sampler plugin coming soon. Uh, check out algorithmicsounds.com. Uh, and for commercial plugin design, uh, talk to me after the after the conference or check out IsaacRoberts.tech. Excellent. Thank you so much, Isaac. Thank you.